York's classic rock. Q1043. <laughs> Cameron Crowe. Academy Award winner is with us here at Q104.3. You have certainly left your mark, and you're still a, a, a young guy. You've left your mark on American cinematic history. There's Pop absolutely culture, no you know. question about that, and you've been doing Thank it since you. you were just a little kid. Thanks, and Jim. now Same to you. Come on. And, and now the... Uh, uh, pro- you know, I mean, you have had so many successful films, obviously, but the one that is probably the most beloved, almost famous, is now a Broadway musical. Yeah. And it's about you. Now, not very many people in your position have as their iconic work... <laughs> A work about themselves. It's it's a very unique situation. It is. I I kind of look at it as a as a story about my mom and my sister. I'm just a bit player, but um, it is kind of about like learning to fall in love with music and getting an assignment and writing for Rolling Stone and getting invited on the road, you know, by a hard rock band that you love and all that stuff. But what's What's cool is that in the in the Broadway version of Almost Famous, I really feel my sister and my mom and this whole kind of dynamic in our family at, that happened over rock. Mm-hmm. You know, rock was banned in my house, so it was a whole thing to like sneak it in. Like when when you just played the Doors and discussed rather poignantly <laughs> the Doors, I, I go back to like my sister smuggling um, Strange Days, the Doors album, into our house. And like us looking behind closed doors at that album cover. And that's the vibe of Almost Famous. You know, mm-hmm. like how, how my sister and I are going to sneak it in uh, past my mom, who's like, a, you know, was a very, I would say, protective teacher mother, you know. Yet even though it's really about you, you renamed the character. It's true. And, you know, why did you do that? Why not just make him Cameron? <laughs> I don't know. That's that's probably like one little step over the line of narcissism or something. Like, <laughs> no, Cameron, no, I, here's how I want you to do that scene, Cameron. <laughs> well, tell me, Cameron. It's like, no, it's just it's just <laughs> such a unique situation. I can fool myself and think it's actually a guy named William Miller, mm-hmm. um, who did some of the same things I did. Though it is all true. I mean, people. I'm usually at the theater every night and afternoon, and I love talking to the music fans that come there. And they, they say, you know, how much of this is true? What's the band Stillwater? What band was that? And uh, I love talking to them about, like, it, it's a little bit of a composite, but all the stuff happened. And some of it's Led Zeppelin, and some of it's Leonard Skinner, mm-hmm. and some of it's the Eagles, you know. But we get the music fans who, who really want to come and kind of geek out and talk about music. So I do it almost every day. Well, I have a text here from uh, a listener who writes, Jim, say hi to Cameron for me. Saw the show. It was fantastic. And that's Sharon Bagel from Bayside. People who have gone to see the show have told me how extraordinary it is. What a great, entertaining experience it is. And thank you, Sharon. Um, (laughs) I mean, we love Sharon. uh, uh, Apparently, it grips you as soon as the show starts. Right yeah. from the right from the very first scene. Well, you're a Michigan guy, so so uh, Lester Bangs is kind of our Lester Bangs, the great rock critic who was an editor at Cream Magazine, which, which is Birmingham. Back. Which is back. It's back. Yes. yes, Lester is kind of our master of ceremonies. So he starts the show. <coughs> I'm, I'm not giving away too much. He starts the show with the words "It's over," and it's a speech about how you know here we are in 1973 and music is peak, rock is over. You know, all the good stuff already happened. And that's how we begin. Well, and he was a contrary soul. He was, but a sweet guy, <laughs> yes. you know. So he he'd debate the tubes with you or the MC five with like so much heart. But then when he'd write about it, it would be corrosive and nasty and gorgeous <laughs> and amazing. And so he was all that stuff. And um, and then it it has well, according to uh, Maria Melito, our midday person, it translated seamlessly from the screen to the stage. That's so great. That was the dream, you know, to, to kind of capture the the feeling that the movie gave people and gives me. I, I really get lost in that time, 1973. It was just a moment before everything got a little more mainstreamy and arenas took over the theaters as far as the main place that a lot of the bands would play. And I don't know, it was just slightly personal then. And that's where the movie took place. 
and I wanted people to be able to come into the theater and feel that in a theater, you know. Well, when you're taking uh, a work that was created for the screen, which gives you the opportunity to go on location, yeah, and um, and you know, if if something's happening outdoors, you're outdoors, you know. Yeah. But now you've got the stage in the theater, and yet I understand the rooftop scene, the plane ride, <laughs> they've all translated. Yeah. They're, you know, I mean, so, so the artists, you work with a bunch of artists who are able to capture those visuals yeah. and put them in that, by comparison, small space, because when you're making a film, you have infinite space. Yeah. You also don't hang out a lot with your, well, we did a little bit on Almost Famous, the movie, but someone like Philip Seymour Hoffman, uh, you know, he drops in for really a few days and leaves and you you live with him forever in your movie, but you don't really live with him. And the the people in our play, we've lived together for three or four years now through COVID and they stuck together to, to still be in the show. It's, it, we did a run in San Diego. It was Diego. in San Diego, yeah. right, yeah. So we all stayed together and we're still together. And I think that feeling, you really you really get it in the theater that those people actually do love hanging out with each other. And of course the map traces their travels yeah. across the country. Yeah. Right up there on the stage. I, d I definitely wanted to have the feeling that, that I had, which was, which was I'm supposed to be in school back home, but I'm in Cleveland. I'm <laughs> going to steal this phone book because it's so great to have a phone book from Cleveland. Look at all <laughs> these people, and they live in Cleveland. I'll never meet them. I, you know, and I would, I would come back home with a, with a suitcase filled with phone books because <laughs> – I just did, never thought I'd ever go back there. And guess what? Today, they'd be great souvenirs. I hope you still have them. Jim, I keep everything. It's a terrible, terrible thing to be a pack rat. <laughs> I still have those people in their phone book. Look I at what my producer is doing now. I should call him up a little bit and go, hey, you guys still in Cleveland? <laughs> I just thought I'd check in. Yeah. Jim's got everything. Call him on the landline. <laughs> yes, brother. Well, um, when you were casting mm -hmm. for the stage yeah yeah you were very deeply personally involved in the whole process yeah and stage actors they're a little different from yeah film actors i think in a great way they they they're happy to say i love you and get emotional and stuff whereas movie movie people often are like do I have to say I love you? Can I say it with my eyes? <laughs> I think if you just put the camera in front of me, you'll feel my love. You know, where <laughs> the musical theater people are like, I will come in on a trapeze and say I love you. This is all about emotion. <laughs> and I love that. I, I, I love that. And it's fun to have both as, a, as an opportunity. Like I, next time I make a movie, I want to use a bunch of the people from the play because they're great. They're just, they pivot in any direction and they, oh, most importantly, they're music lovers. Yeah. And you feel it. And there's a difference when you put someone in a movie or a play who doesn't really care about music and you have them playing somebody who loves music, you can tell. That's Cameron Crowe with us. Well, I felt that, that they were music lovers when I saw the Tonight Show performance. Cool. Yeah. They are. Yeah. And they were really emotional about being, you know, on the Tonight Show doing yeah, well, they Tiny must have been. They must have been really excited. Oh, baby. They were so excited. And Fallon, J Jimmy Fallon was in the movie, you know, so Fallon right. was like, you know, Fallon was like welcoming them into the almost famous experience from the movie side. It was such a cool yeah. afternoon. And you have invited him and he has accepted yeah. your invitation to yeah. at some point make a guest appearance on the Broadway stage. Yeah, which I think would be great. I'm trying to get this marriage going between the movie cast and the, and the yeah. theater cast. And you know what? I heard from Eric Stone Street who uh, it was in Modern Family and, you know, much beloved. He was still kind of a coming up actor when he was in the movie. And he's the guy that, that says, you know, your mom is a handful to uh, <laughs> William Miller. He, he's a hotel clerk. And he's going to come see it. And I'm, we're talking about him dropping in and doing his line, surprising people. Mm. Some cool cameos. Stage. Yeah. Yeah. Just drop him in, man. Well, Jonathan, <clears throat> you were raving. Yeah, I saw it and it was fantastic, you know, and, and as you were talking about your mother and your sister, uh, and this also happens in the show, which is, you know, kind of 
I think a lot of people had that experience when they got albums from their older brother or older sister. I mean, it happened to me. You know what I mean? And in, it happens in the movie when your sister gives you these, or William Miller's yeah. sister gives him, you got, this is like required listening. Yeah. You must listen to these and then, you know, this will happen. Yeah. And I've always resonated with me in the in the film so and on cool. the show as well. Those are my records at the beginning of Almost Famous, the movie. The real you album. You can tell. Yeah, final. you can tell. Yeah. Uh, our friend Amanda here had a, a photo of her treasured copy of Blue, the Joni Mitchell album Blue. And, you know, you know when an album has been played a lot. You can tell. Well, Joni Mitchell was there on opening night. Did you get a chance to uh, chat? Amanda is here in the room with us. Uh, you did? Oh, yeah. Oh, cool. Did you have the album with you just in case? <laughs> <laughs> Cameron Crowe is with us. We'll be right back at Q104.3. Where do you have that uh, Oscar, Mr. Cameron Crowe? <laughs> yeah, where do you keep it? Um, it floats around, you know. I move it around from time to time. Sometimes I forget that it exists. and then I, How can I, you forget it? It is a big deal. It's kind of a big deal. Like, even when you said it a minute ago, I was like, oh, yeah. That's, that's right. Cool. <laughs> I know that dude. Because it's it like is a, cool. It's you see, a I mean, you, when you you had these dreams as a kid, yeah. and you surpassed your dreams. True. You know, true. My I mean, original dream was to just have a story in Rolling Stone. Right, and then, uh, and, the, and but you got an Academy Award, and which you know goes what? beyond having an article in Rolling it, Stone. It definitely does. And what's funny is you go into a dream state when they announce your name. It was the strangest thing. I mean, I definitely did not expect to win. I was there with my mom, star of uh, Almost Famous on Broadway, uh, but, you Elaine know, but... Miller. But the real thing, my mom was sitting next to me going, practice your speech. Practice your speech. Well, moms like, mom, are doing mom duty. That's I'm what moms gonna do. Not, I'm not going to win. I've not won in this category through every award show for the last three months. I'm not going to win. The, this other guy it wins every time. And so it was the commercial break before the my category was coming up. And the guy who who had won every other award was already being congratulated down the aisle, you know, of where I was sitting. So I was like, Mom, look, he's already won. <laughs> he's, he's, he's already accepting appreciation, you know. And then Tom Hanks got up there and said my name. And it was like, whoa. And I have... Uh, a fear of public speaking, right? So he, in Tom Hanks being the uber professional, saw it on my face as I kind of stepped up there with these wide eyes, and he, he said, I'm really happy that you won this. You know, this is really cool. So I'm just going to give you this, and you'll turn around and say a few words, and then you'll come back. It's going to be great. And I was like, thank you, St. Tom Hanks. <laughs> that is awesome. Thank you. And I turned around, have no memory of what I said, and then uh, it was over, and it was like, whoosh, you know, uh, but, everything returned back to normal time. By the way, Maria Molito, this is Cameron Crowe. Cameron Crowe, this is Maria Molito. I actually came in early after to me. see you. Uh, I appreciate that. She told, <laughs> I did, too. She yeah. told she told me when she saw the show, speaking of Tom Hanks, uh, that uh, the actor who plays uh, Will reminds her. In, oh, in, wow. Of, Tom of, Hanks and Big. How cool. Yes, yes. I see that. I see yes. that. That's really great. The same that's energy. Great. Just some, I mean, uh, Obviously, his look, dark hair, yeah. younger, but there's something about his energy, and yeah. it just reminded me, it just like sucked me in. I'm like, oh my God, Tom oh, Hanks. That's big. And that's so, so cool great. about your Tom Hanks. Like, <laughs> that makes me feel like he's so fatherly to say that to you. I know. That it's is awesome. so, it's I, mean, really cool. I mean, that is so great. It's really great. cool. I mean, and for you, okay, because look at, we all know you're a big, big, big success, but you're still. The Freaked kid. out. No, you're still the kid. <laughs> you're still the kid. Absolutely. You still are. That kid still lives within you. And to have Tom, to come to the realization yeah. that Tom Hanks is kind of telling you yeah. that he's a fan of you, yeah. of you. <laughs> I mean, because he said that he's glad you won. Yeah. That means he's Pretty a cool. fan of Cameron Crowe. He's True. a big kid, though. I mean, he's got the 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 childlike enthusiasm thing to to the max. I mean, you feel it all the time. Um, and he definitely was radiating it that night. We, uh, I, I wrote Jerry Maguire for Tom Hanks. Really? Wow. Yeah. And he was the first guy to get the script. And uh, he turned it down because he was going to do that thing you do instead, and that was going to be what his a mu great music movie. thing. I know, fantastic, <laughs> what right? What a great yeah. movie that was. But Hanks, I got to say, he in the same way, like when the Oscar moment happened, I talked to him on the phone 
where he passed, you know, on being Jerry Maguire, but he was so cool and supportive and friendly that I didn't even realize he'd passed until after I hung up. <laughs> <laughs> My friends are like, so is he going to do it? And I'm like, no, but it was really such cool. Such a good guy. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, okay, great. Who are you going to get now? I'm like, I don't know. But Tom Hanks so great. Tom Cruise. And then completely different thing. Tom Cruise read the script and was essentially like, he was in England making a movie with Stanley Kubrick. Amazing, right? And he yeah. he said, uh, "I'll tell you what." Like all my friends are saying, he's the biggest star in the world. Be careful. You know, like a, a machine will come in and remove you and it'll be somebody else. You know? and, but it's there was Tom Cruise saying like, you know, listen, I really like this script. How about if I fly from England in a few weeks? We'll sit down and I'll read it for you and you'll see if I'm right for it. Oh, You're God. Like, cool. cool. <laughs> yeah, I'll be here. And he, true to his word, he did exactly that, you know. Okay, so let's go back to let's 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 channel the inner will. Yeah. Okay. For sure. First record you fell in love with. Buffalo Springfield, uh first album. Do you remember reading about them in Teen Set magazine? I do not. <laughs> there was an Tell editor. Me about that, Jim. There was an editor. <laughs> there was an editor, a woman in Teen Set magazine. And it was your basic teen idol type of magazine. Yeah. She had this thing for Buffalo Springfield. Wow. And so in, in like 1966, uh, going into early 67, in that magazine, Buffalo Springfield was prominently featured every single month. And wow. they didn't fit with the rest of the stuff in there. Wow. So I always thought that was pretty wild. Wow. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, I guess they could have been like a teen band at some point. But they became more artistic. That's cool. This and is why he's in the Radio Hall of Fame, no by the kidding, way. No kidding, man. Because he has the most impeccable memory. Oh, right? Uh, no, it's true. It's true. I just have to give kudos. You know, okay, to and remember the, everything. Okay, and I hope the, he and, still has the and, magazine and the, because and, you know. And, and the first, <laughs> yeah. And the first, bust it out, Jim. Come on, I know you got it. <laughs> and and the first movie that you bought a ticket for. Oh, um, the oh, this is a good one. Well. I went with my sister to see uh, uh, the Clint Eastwood movie, A Fistful of Dollars. Nice. Okay. Yeah. But the one the one that was kind of galvanizing was uh, The Graduate. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, that was, that oh. was the That's one. That's when yeah. film yeah. movies changed. That, yeah, that, yeah. Was, that was the first R-rated movie I ever yeah. saw. Yeah, sexy, sexy stuff. Yeah. But um, a rock soundtrack. Mm -hmm. yes. To, yes. To us at the time. Yes, Simon an Brian awesome Uncle. soundtrack yeah. with Simon Amazing. And, and one artist, you know, which was uh, always such a good thing when there's one artist who's kind of spread out throughout the whole movie, like Harold and Maude. Yeah. Anytime yeah. I ever yeah. see fish in an aquarium, uh, you know, parsley, sage, rosemary, and thyme goes through see? my head. I mean, <laughs> yeah. When you get that marriage of <laughs> cinema and the song, you don't, you don't forget it. It's, it's the true. coolest thing. It's Can I ask true. a quick question, Jim? Sure, go, please. I want to ask, uh, okay. <laughs> I am a golden god. Please tell us a story behind that line. I if there's you were something saying, true I, Jonathan, that happened, I'm a golden god. No, 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 no. It works. We'll get to that it later. It works for me. Yeah. No, but what was the genesis of that line? Did someone actually say that, or was it just made up in the writing of the uh, screenplay? It's it's a great question. Uh, Almost Famous has a bunch of Easter eggs in it, and and there's little pockets of trivia spread throughout and i'm a golden god was actually said by robert plant in a photo session at the continental hyatt house and there's a picture of him kind of on a balcony with his arms spread and he he has just said i am a golden god and what's funny is you know when we were trying to get led zeppelin's music for almost famous we flew to england and showed them the movie. It was like the one day when Jimmy Page and Robert Plant got together to do their business stuff, and they came in to see the screening, and I was there with the editor, and we were scared out of our minds that, you know, how they might like the movie or not. And so we just sat at the back, and their two heads, Plant and Page, were there, like, in the third row, and we'd watch them as they as they moved to whisper something to each other. And we were like, do they like it? Do they like it? I don't know. And um, so... <laughs> At one point in the movie, Billy Crudup says, uh, <coughs> Jason Lee says, you know, you said I am a golden god. He goes, I never said I was a golden god. And Plant goes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> and I looked at Joe, our editor, and I was like, we're in. We're in, man. Oh, man. We're in. 
And uh, it ended, and and they they gave us uh, five songs. Amazing. I know it was amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So the the Broadway musical opened. It was a big gala event. I mean, it was, it, you know, you see movies. You go back all the way to the 1930s, and there are a lot of movies where it's opening night on Broadway. Yeah. And everybody's all so nervous. <sighs> and they're pacing back and forth. I know. And they're hiding in the corner during intermission to listen to hear what people are saying. <sighs> is that what the reality of it is? Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of how it happened, Jim. <laughs> um, Amanda was there. We we She brought Joni Mitchell in, and... The audience kind of gave her applause, Whoa, and there was a nice. whole buzz as they, she came down the aisle. And it was, you know, it was a grand moment for sure. I take none of that for granted. It's to be treasured. Well, it's uh, the Bernard B. Jacobs Theater. Broadway, Cameron yeah, Crowe. baby. Broadway. Gotta come, Jim. Gotta, gotta drop on and in. And you might see Cameron at the show. You never know. Apparently, a lot of people have met you at the show because I've, you know, been getting texts and stuff from people who who spotted you and just said hello at the theater. Sharon from Bayside took a photo with them. She tried to text it to us. That's wild. Yeah. Well, I've been in a room writing for a little bit, so got out and just meeting people now. <laughs> no, they're great. The, the the people that come to see Almost Famous, they're um, a lot of the times it's their first Broadway experience because they're, you know, they came because of the movie or the or the music. So they they'll sometimes say like, "What's it like?" You know, like is is it different because it's Broadway? And, and and I love talking to them, saying like, "Well, it's it's a music experience and it's a play. It's both." And kind of the the OG theater people and the and the music fans that have never been to the Broadway show, like they kind of have bonded by the end. We have this finish of Fever Dog a reprise of Fever Dog, and everybody gets to shine in it, which I'm so proud of. Like, every little character in the play, and there's 17 people in their first Broadway debuts, they all get to take the stage and sing part of Fever Dog. And and people love it. Our composer, Tom Kidd, had that idea towards the end of us working on it. Where I would be like, we got to have rock. we got to have a big rock finish. And one day he's like, well, I love let's that just song. bring Fever Dog yeah. back. Yeah. I love that yeah. song. Write a new verse of Fever yeah. Dog. Yeah. So yeah. We, we, Nancy Wilson, the famous Nancy Wilson of Heart, like, uh, came up with a third verse. We worked on a third verse for Fever Dog, which is very Stillwater-esque. Right. And, uh, and that's how the show ends. Well, Maria left me a note that reads, if you never saw the movie, you will still appreciate the Broadway show. If you love music, you will love Almost Famous the Musical. That's wow. the quote that from her. We love true. Maria. Oh. That's, <laughs> that's, that's true. Thank and you. Thank you. Really thank you so much, and, you guys. And thank we you. love you, thank and you. we thank you so much for visiting with us so today. So fun. Congratulations on the fun. show. John Congratulations. So good. Thank you, man. That thank show is so going to be running for a long, 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 long time. Yes, and I smell a Tony. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> I do. I there we go. It's going to run for, well, we'll put that right next to the... Oscar. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Thanks, you guys. Yeah. It's eight thirty-six. Cameron Crowe, let's give him yeah. a round of yes. applause. Yes, I applaud you. <laughs> New York's classic rock, Q one zero four three.